As the lights go down and the screen comes up, there is a darkness that hangs over the land that is ominous, eerie, so thick you could almost feel it, draped across all the rock crevices, the small trails through the dry brush and forgotten trees. As our camera pushes through, the small valley appears. Thick cloud of smoke still hangs over most rooftops from evening fires that have long since been put out. The lack of breeze has still the smoke in the air. As we rise and go effortly over the rooftops, the wisp of smoke breaks across lenses and we see it appear, large walls up and over the columns, past the torches that the guards are using in the dead of night to keep watch and into the courtyard we go. There it's a different story. Everything is green, watered, manicured. And as we push to the large pillars, holding up the porch on the master chambers, we slide over the rail and into the room. Large tapestry of silk around the bed, and yet through it, you can see him tossing, turning. Hours have gone by that seem like days. The body knows it needs sleep. It's the mind that won't shut off. Not another night like this. In an air of frustration, he sits up, slides his feet over the side of the bed and let him rest on the cool marble tile. With a deep breath, he'll get up and walk to that porch that we've just gone through. Calloused hands grab the stone rail. His eyes will stare at anything, nothing over his kingdom. What do you do? when you've given it over to God? What do you do when you've done the right Christian thing and you still can't turn it off? Where you're boiling up inside, where they've gotten away with it, or this is still happening, where the frustration that's in front of you is now taking a toll physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. He will turn to his desk. He will light a candle. He will get out the ink and put it to parchment. And there he writes, poetry. I never got that growing up. I'm a guy that grew up in West Texas here in the States, not a big fan of poetry. This guy writes poetry and he plays a harp. Something else I didn't get growing up. I grew up in the 80s with the MTV generation. And for those of you younger, you know of MTV, but I just wanna tell you there was a day music television had actually music on it. And when we got home from school, we'd go to the one house in our community that had cable and we'd watch our bands, our heroes, our rock now on videos after video, after video, after video. You know, all those years of watching MTV, what I never saw, that's right, a harp. I never saw anybody walk on up on stage and just bring on the harp. I never got it. This guy will sit, play a harp, and put lyrics to it. And before I lose some of you that go, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I understand, you have to understand this is an outlet for a warrior, a king, a man who writes in the dead of night because he can't sleep and he's about to tell us why, a man whose arm shows the physical scars from battle after battle. You see, early on, it was whispered in his ear that he would be king. That's a lot of weight to put on the shoulders of a young lad, but giant killing came easy to him. Battle came easy to him. Victory, secret service came easy to him. It's the heart that has the scars. It took a while to get the crown, but once he had it, he realized the weight of it and the importance of ruling the kingdom. He lost importance of family. In his own castle, he saw his oldest son rape one of his daughters. Oh, he went in and got mad and he yelled, but that was it. You see, dad doesn't have much to say to a son who rapes a daughter when dad has had an affair with the woman next door and King David doesn't have much ground to stand on talking about morality and sexuality with the son. When his second son, Absalom, knows what happened to his sister and watches for a year, dad won't do anything to his oldest brother, Absalom will take him out in the field and kill his oldest brother and dad has to sit with that weight. Meanwhile, second son, Absalom, will disrespect dad grow with bitterness of dad because my old man didn't take up and do what he was supposed to do. I had to kill my brother and that way I'm a better king. I'm probably better fit leader for this family. And Absalom's son will run dad out of his kingdom. 
sleep with his dad's wives on the rooftop in front of everyone just to let them know there's a new man in the family. And David will gather his forces, come back and regain his kingdom. And while they're chasing Absalom, his hair will be caught in the thicket. He'll be pulled off his horse and they'll put spears through his heart. And David has lost two sons, a daughter living with an unbearable truth that she can't face. And son number three and four have a battle for the kingdom. And son four kills son number three. Yeah, this is King David in the Old Testament. Read 2 Samuel. If you're, I don't know, PG, probably 17. Read 2 Samuel. This is a guy that sits and does lyrics. He's battle tested. He's a warrior. He's dang good at fighting with his hands. His family has been in shambles. He's tried to lead the best that he can, but he's fallen so many times and he's found an outlet. He's good with words. He will sit and write poetry. And I don't know about you, but now I no longer see it when I go to church. And when I was a kid, they had flannel graph. They put up these little figures of David. He was a little scrawny kid and he wore a white mini skirt and he had a harp and I couldn't relate to the Psalms. But now with the picture I've just given you, a biblical picture of this man, when he sits and writes Psalms 39, I sit up a little straight. I may not be good with poetry or words, but I get this. Everybody needs a place to vent. He has found ink and paper. I know you've been doing this series of Psalms. It's so glad to join you. We're jumping into Psalm 39. North Point, thanks for allowing me to be a part of this. I've loved your pastor. Andy Stanley has been an encouragement to me. His teachings have improved me. I remember when I... To who? Who's Mark Clark? I never read it. So what's the name of the church? Just put it, where was I at? Here? So Village Church, thanks for inviting me to be part of what you're doing today in your series on Psalm. I love your pastor. I remember the first time I met Clark and Clark and I were hanging out. He's been an encouragement to me in my life and my, it's his last name? What's his first name? Well, so, can someone write it on a cue card? Just put it behind the camera. Thank you. And start it all over. Vint, is it vintage or village? Village Church, I remember the first time I met Mark Clark and the encouragement that he has been to me in my ministry. <laughs> I don't know, what do you expect? You ask a guy like me to be part of your church, I'm gonna screw the whole thing up. I love what you guys are doing. I remember hanging out South Vancouver the first time I got to speak to you guys in the cool school gym where no one could sit in the front because the cameras were all in. I went and I saw it in the theater and now I see you guys have a plan to take over Canada. Sweet, because you know the US ain't gonna take over Canada. You guys need to take over us. But in all honesty, he's probably out golfing somewhere today. And good, it gives me a chance to show up and say, we love you guys. Our church down here in the San Diego area has always followed um, what you guys are doing at Village Church. Um, we, we love what's happening in Vancouver, in Toronto. I love that you guys are gonna be going coast to coast. I love that there are so many people up in Canada that you are resonating with. I love the week that my son and I got to spend in your community and the people that we met there. And so when you guys said, hey, you guys, when Mark said, buddy, can you help me out? Can you do Psalm 39? I was like, really, a psalm? Really? And I had to go back and stand there. I had to go back to the castle of the king, stand behind David as he sits at his desk late at night because this has got him up. He's tried to do the right thing, but his heart and his head are heavy and his mind won't let him sleep. I had to go back and remind myself who writes this. It's a warrior king and things haven't come easy. It's a guy that has screwed up big time, but you know what? He had the guts to print it and put it in the Bible. It's a guy who has one of the most dysfunctional, in fact, I will say, even taking Roman emperors into account, the most dysfunctional family in all of history. And God says, print it. That's good Bible. I can use people like that because David's not the hero of the story. David's gonna point to the hero of the story. And on nights when he can't sleep, on nights when you and I toss and turn because we can't let something go, we turn to Psalm 39. 
Mark, thanks for letting me be a part of your church. Village, get out a Bible. Psalm 39, I know this isn't a good time right now. I know most of you are having to watch from home right now. I know we all want this thing to end and we don't know when COVID is gonna end. There's no expiration date on it. I know there's a lot of frustrations and doing church right now like this isn't the time we want, but still it's the word of God. Don't listen to some pastor friend of Mark's coming in on this day. Take out your Bible, Psalm 39. Get ready with something to circle, highlight, and underline. And let's jump in. Verse one, David's writing. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good, my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me. And as I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue and I love the way it sets. He goes, look, I try to do what's right. I tried to look at the wording he has, keep my tongue from sin. I tried to put a muzzle on my mouth. I tried not to respond in the wrong way. I tried to make sure I didn't blow it. I know I got a track record of being a hothead at times. I know I've done some really stupid jacked up things in my past, but I'm really trying hard to do this God's way. But you know what? It keeps boiling up. You know what? I don't know where to take my frustration right now. And, and, and you know what? It's just not working for me. And that's how Psalm 39 starts. May, I, may I remind you, if you, go, if you haven't jumped back and looked at 38, what he's facing. Go, go back. Just look the page to the left. Psalm 38, verse 12. Those who seek my life set their traps. Those who would harm me talk of my ruin. All day long they plot deception. I'm like a deaf man who cannot hear, like a mute who cannot open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. I wait for you, O Lord. You will answer, O Lord, my God. And I love that. He goes, look, I'm talking about real things. Before we get further into Psalm chapter 39, you've got to get that person in mind. What is that person, problem, politics of your nation today that keeps you up at night? What is that little soundtrack that you listen to that just makes your heart boil up? You get frustrated. David said, look, these are real people that are trying to hurt me. These are people that have stabbed me in the back. These are people that are slandering me. These are people that are attacking me. Is it that boss at work who's a jerk? Is it that fellow coworker that just wants to rip you down? Is it that family member? Is it that ex? Is it the lawsuit who once was a partner, but now they're stabbing you in the back? Who is it, what is it that is unfair, unjust? And you said, look, I'm gonna handle God. I'm gonna be mute. I'm gonna be deaf. I'm not gonna listen. I'm not gonna say a word. I'm gonna give it to God. Good job, Christian. That's the way to respond in chapter 38. By chapter 39, he goes, I'm done. I tried to muzzle it. I tried to keep quiet. You know what? I'm up again late at night. I'm writing again late at night. Can someone help me deal with my frustrations about the things that I'm seeing in front of me right now? And this is for all of us that have that person, that place, that problem, that thing that we can't get off our chest, off our mind. And this will be good news for all of us today, village. Here we go, verse four. So show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. And that seems like an odd place to turn, isn't it? Man, I'm so frustrated with what I'm dealing with. I'm so frustrated with this person. I've tried to give it to you, God. I've tried to say you can handle it, but now I find it boiling up. And he goes from venting to now praying. Show me, oh God, how short and despicable my life is, how meaningless my existence is. And at first I'm like, oh, this guy's depressed. Man, this guy's hitting bottom. Show me that my life is a mere hand breath between these four fingers, one of the, the smallest measurements at that time. Show me that I'm a mist, a vapor. And yet there's a beauty in this where I feel like David's saying, can you remind me that what I'm dealing with is temporary? Can you remind me that what's going on in front of me is not eternal? Can you remind me that this isn't as big as I'm making it to be? I, I have done this thing with my wife for about 25 years now, and we've been, we've been married 25 years. Hey, next week, by the way, thanks. I'll wait for your gift. And, and we've always had this little thing when something's pressing or frustrating. We always have this little thing that says this. How's this gonna affect us three weeks from now? How's this gonna affect us three months from now? How's this gonna affect us three years from now? And how's this gonna affect us 30 years from now? 
And you know what? The majority of things in front of us that are frustrating us don't have much impact three weeks or three months from now even. Very few things have impact three years from now. And 30 years from now, See, it gives me a way to get perspective from the problem that's immediate in front of me. Why is there so much energy coming from my life? Why is this physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally taking such a toll on me? Usually because it's my pride that's been hurt. Usually because chapter 30, I got people that are tearing me down. I got people that are attacking me. I got people that said this about me. I got a guy that took advantage of me. I got a coworker that took advantage. I got a partner that just stabbed me in the back. I got people and go, yeah, those are real things, aren't they? But David, from venting, I tried to give it to you, God, and now it keeps boiling up. He sits down and he writes out a prayer. God, remind me the brevity of life. Remind me I'm a mere mist, a phantom, a hand breath, how fleeting my life is. I love the way James 4, verses 13 and 14 say this. Whoa, 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 village church, woe to you who say this year or that year, we're gonna go here or there, carry on business and make a lot of money. For you don't even know what your life is. You're a mist of vapor. You're here today, gone tomorrow. That's not meant to depress you. That's meant to take your vision off of you. See, when it's your pride that's been hurt and it's when my possessions that have been taken, when I'm the one that's been taken advantage of, when I can step back and get an eternal perspective, I realize my life better revolve around something bigger than me. I'm a very puny orbit in the grand scheme of things. I better revolve around something more than me. And James 4 says, you're mist, you're vapor, you're here today, you're gone tomorrow. Instead, you ought to be concerned with what is God's will for my life. I like that picture. Village Church, here you are. You wanna see your life? Biblically, this is your life. You were born, you went to school, you got married and you died, and you're gone. Did you miss it? Were you not looking at the screen? You missed what happened? I'll do it one more time for you, okay? Here's the story of your grand life. You were born, you went to school, you got married, or you're still single, and then one day you're gonna die and you're gone. Let me tell you this, you smell good, you're kind of fruity, but even that's gonna dissipate in a few moments. There's your life. So what about this short vapor did you get so caught up in? What in your Canadian politics have got you so wrapped up right now? What about this COVID season has got you so frustrated because it's so hard to find truth or facts? No, no, let me take that back. It's easy to find truth and facts. The problem is there's 28 different sets of truths and facts that go against your truth and facts. And that has frustrated all of us. But I love this biblical picture. You wanna get through it? Then stop focusing on this. (laughs) because that's a very small picture. And David said, God, can you remind me how short this life is? May I remind you how short mine, even my wealth is, who's gonna get it and where does it go? And instead he turns here, verse seven. But now, Lord, what do I look for? So if if that mist vapor is my life, so, so what do I look for? What do I put my hope in? My hope is in you. Save me from all of my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of my fools. I was silent, I would not open my mouth, for you are the one who has done this. Remove your your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. You rebuke and discipline men for their sin. You consume their wealth like a moth. Each man is but a breath. He goes, so two things. My hope's gonna be in you, not what's going on in front of me. You are what I'm gonna focus on because that is eternal and that can't be taken away. That can't be robbed from me. That can't be diminished. You are what I'm gonna focus on. And I'm gonna remind myself, you are judge, jury. You are prosecutor. You have this. They're not getting away with anything. I I, I constantly try to remind our church down here that God is deeply, passionately, and intimately in love with you. He cannot, will not ever take his hands, his eyes off of you. Psalms 139. Wherever you go, wherever you're sleeping, whenever you're awake, wherever you stand, rise, walk, sit, lay down, he is there. If you go to the height he's there, the depth you can go to, he's there. As far east as far west, it does not matter. His right hand is there to guide you. His left hand is there to hold you fast. It doesn't mean life is great. David will end Psalm 139 going, but if only, if only you'd have taken the wicked away, if only you'd have kept me from this, but still even in that, you were with me. Do you get that picture? Village, do you get that picture? 
Because I think if we truly walked understanding how God sees us, how we see the rest of the world and our problems in front of us would dissipate some, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? My kids are teenagers now. Very different stage of life for us, three teenagers. Yeah, another reason why I think schools should be open and I don't care what the health code and care is right now, get them out of the house, but three teenagers right now. I remember when they were small and I would come home from work. I remember they'd hear my truck pull up in the driveway. Still West Texas got a truck, even in San Diego. I remember I'd hear the squeal from inside the house. That screen door would be kicked open. And by the time I was halfway to the front door, they were running after me where they would attack both legs, where that little brother behind him was just kind of waddling, snot all over his face. It looked like we moosed his hair all the time simply because he would always go, <laughs> and his hair just constantly was snot stick up in the air. His, his little shorts or sweatpants were three times their size because I don't know what's all in that diaper, but it should have been changed a while ago. But man, that kid's carrying a load. And when his sisters came out in their little spring dresses and their little sandals that matched their spring dress and their little clip in their hair that matched their spring dress and their sandals, I started to learn about accessorizing. And I would give them a hug and I'd put in the signs and then that little thing would come. And I'd always stop and put up my hand and go, whoa, 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 come on, you stink. And your face is all jacked up. Go get cleaned up. Go get cleaned up and come back and give dad a hug. And that little kid would always just stop and start to cry and I'd have to walk around him. And I'm like, man, kids gotta learn. Of course not, of course not. That kid came to me with crusty face, snot stuck hair, britches that were about to explode on something. I'd grab him under the armpits and I'd pick him up faster than he was expecting. And I'd always take him up higher to that point where zero gravity, where he'd stop and go, <laughs> And then I'd bring him back and I'd throw him sideways and I would take my face and I would just nuzzle it into him. Have you forgotten or never accepted that? See, the problem with Christianity is I can hear the truth about God, but I still see me as I see me because I know the truth about Chris and I know what's jacked up. And I know what's crusted and scabbed over. And when I sit down to write, I know the wounds in my life, in my family, and those I've created in others. And I can take the right answer in Psalms that God loves me, that God won't take his hands off me, God won't take his eyes off of me, God has all my days numbered. But I have a hard time accepting his truth when mine is when I've lived. Village church, has it ever dawned on you that you are his child. That you are deeply, passionately loved by the creator of the universe. That he knows everything about you and where you've been and what you've done. And in spite of yourself, he gave the ultimate price just to grab you and all the junk that you're carrying and say, accept a higher truth. You are a child of God. You are a prince or princess in his kingdom. You are heir to the throne and that is eternal and how dare you allow this to change your value and your worth and to rob you of what should never be taken. Huh. And that's why I love the Psalms. They bring me back to there is real problems, there is real people, there is real oppression, there's real frustration in my life. And I've made it about my life. And I forgot that I'm eternal. And my part of life here on earth is a mere hand breath, a vapor, a mist, it vanishes. And I forgot whose I am because I was getting all wrapped up in who I am and other people were attacking or taking advantage of who I am. And that's the temporary. Oh Lord, you are my hope. And because you love me and because you cannot take your eyes off of me, you rebuke them, you discipline them, you can consume their wealth, you sick them, God. I don't know how many times I've paid prayers of sick them, God. Got this email, ooh, I God, I'm not even responding to this. I'm gonna muzzle my mouth, I'm gonna keep this, up. sick them, sick them. I love praying to God and putting stuff in his hand, always saying, God, it's your right to do what you want, but I get to tell God what I want. 
And then I just think in my mind, they're on their way to work tomorrow and two tires fall off their car in the middle of the freeway. They jack up everything. They don't get hurt. Then that bad. But man, their car is, and I'm like, what happened? You messed with the child of God. You messed with the king's son. I don't actually know what happened the next day, but in my mind, it makes me feel good that I just said, sick him, God, you are judge, you are a journey on this side of eternity or on the next. God, it's yours, it's not mine. That's not just Psalms 39. That's throughout the Bible beginning to end. God, you deal with them. I'm your boy. I'm gonna wrap myself up in your arms. I don't deserve your love. I can't earn your love. I will never live up to it. But because it is your truth, I will accept your truth as higher than the truth I know about me and I will accept it. And God, you take care of them. And then watch what flows. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping, for I dwell with you as an alien, a stranger, as all my fathers were. Look away from me that I may rejoice again before I depart and I am no more. Well, Chris, it left him is I'm a stranger. I'm an alien to God. I'm separated from God. And one day I'm gonna die. That's a miserable ending. No, 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 come on. It didn't say that, did it? Look back, circle, highlight, underline. Verse 12, hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping. Now here it comes. For I dwell with you, circle, highlight, underline, as an alien, a stranger, as all my fathers were. You see, at the end of this venting process, this prayer to God, David come back and realize this isn't my life. This isn't my land. This isn't my kingdom. I'm a stranger here. I'm a foreigner here. And I'm a foreigner with you, not apart from you. Uh, I'm, Father God, a stranger with you, not a stranger from you. May I remind you of the man who sits and writes in the palace of the king. Because scripture has context, context, context. He was anointed to be king by the prophet. He's a giant killer, one named Goliath specifically. He was part of the special forces unit. You get all of his battles in 1 Samuel, um, in the book of 1 Samuel. He was a poet. He's a musician. He was king. If there's anyone who has right to say, look, I'm somebody important. I have value. I'm a citizen. This is my home, my castle, my land, my people. It is David. And yet he is the one with all the titles and all the positions, all the preferences his, he's the one that has to lay it down and goes, I'm a a mere breath, I'm a vapor, I'm a mist, I'm here today, I'm gone tomorrow. You know what, I'm a foreigner in this land because if I let my heart and head get wrapped up in this land, that's why I can't sleep at night. How about you? You say, Chris, that's, that's pretty easy. I got my problem. I'm going to take my prayer to God. I got to change my perception. And when I change my perception, I have a new purpose. You like the way I did that? That's the old Baptist side of me coming up. I've got a problem. I'm going to take my prayer to God. I'm going to change my perception. And with that perception, now I have a new purpose. I'm with God. It's no longer about who and what is against me. It's who I am with. It's no longer who I am. It's whose I am. And you go, okay, another great Bible lesson. Get it. How do we apply it to our life? From Psalm 39, because I think you guys are only going to 40 in this series. Can we turn to Psalm 73? And this is where I'm going to end. Psalm 73. Turn to the right. Psalm 73. Let me show you how this plays out in reality. For those of you right now going, but I'm struggling with some depression, some real disappointment in life, some real despair. I need some encouragement. Let me show you another leader in the kingdom. Psalm 73. I don't know if your Bible says who it's from, but on the top of mine, it says a Psalm of Asaph. Now you got to go back and do a little Bible geeky stuff. I know Mark's phenomenal with that stuff. His brain amazes me. I love your pastor and hanging out with him and his wife and just one, he's goofy anyway, like me. Um, But I've always been amazed at minds like that and how it works. For me, I got to go back and go, Asaph, who? And I Google, do a little search, a little Bible search, come back and go, you know who this guy is? This guy's the chief worship leader of Israel. The people of God, God's people, God's land, Israel, he's their head worship leader for the nation of God, for the children of God. So this is a pretty up there dude. You know, right below Mark Clark, Asaph. That's kind of priority wise in the kingdom. Right below David, Asaph. Watch what he writes. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And it starts like one of those Psalms. Yeah, yeah, God is good. God loves those who loves him. Amen, let's eat. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. 
Asaph gets done playing worship. Maybe he did have a harp back then. Let's just pretend it's electric. <laughs> Power harp stance, closing chord, walks off stage. Congregation now turns to scripture. And somewhere back in the green room, he feels like a hypocrite. And if you catch him in a moment of weakness, he'll let you know. Hey, look, I know God is good. I know God is good to those who are pure in heart. I'm just not that pure in heart. Can I tell you how I almost slipped? Can I tell you how I was this far away from throwing in the towel and losing it all? I envied the arrogance and the prosperity of the wicked. My heart and mind, my eyes were set on the world and how they were living and what they're getting away with. Hey, Vancouver, beautiful city, beautiful area, huh? Even Toronto, yeah? I've been to Vancouver. You guys had me out there. Did the little, uh, uh, what is it called? Float plane. Did one of those little float plane things that took off there in the harbor, went out to an island, took my son and did that. Went up in that tower. I don't know the name of your tower. Saw the city. Man, gorgeous place. But man, the wealth of that place. I remember being in downtown. Oh, I forgot the name of it. Steam clock, steampunk clock, old clock tower, broken clock street. Yeah, I was down there. Man, just down there for a night, sitting out there in the restaurants and looking at the cars. And I had my boy with me who was probably, what, sixth grade at the time? Dad, look at that Ferrari. Dad, look at that. Dad, look. And I'm like, man, it's like a car show down here. You know what happens? I try to keep myself Christian and walk like Christ wants me to. And it doesn't seem like I'm getting blessed that much. You know who is getting blessed? They are. And Asaph says, let me tell you, I started focusing on the mist and the vapor. And let me show you how it works. They being the world, they don't seem to have any struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Their pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their calloused hearts comes the iniquity and the evil conceits of their minds knows no limit. They scoff, they speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven. Their tongues take possessions of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They're the popular ones. They say, well, how can God know? Does the most high have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like, always carefree and always increasing in wealth. Now, here is your chief worship leader for the nation of Israel saying, I know God is good to those who are pure in heart, but you want to know how I almost blew it? I started focusing on the world and what they're getting away with and what they're saying and what they're doing and their arrogance and their greed. And it doesn't look like there's an injustice. It doesn't look like God's punishing them. It doesn't look like God's against them at all. And you know what? They're the popular ones. They're what's leading our nation right now. I want you to write this down. You want to take what David did in Psalms 39. When we got to take our problems to prayer, our prayers got to change our perception and that perception will change your purpose. How do we change that perception? Here's what I want you to write down. Focusing on others will leave us depressed. I promise you that. Focusing on others are going to lead you to depression. Here's what I want you to do, Village Church, on your own. Go back and just circle the pronouns. This is homework for you. Just Psalm 73. Can I just read the first 12 verses? I'm only going to read the pronouns. This is your worship leader saying, you, you know how I got depressed? They, their, they, they, their, they, their, their, they, their, they, their, 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 them, they, they. 17 times. Hey guys, I'll, I'll be honest with you because you're not my church and if it gets back to my church, I'll just deny it. About three weeks ago, I had to pull the plug and call a timeout on my life. Took my family and we just, I know COVID, I know it may not have been wise in a lot of people's mind, but I just took my family down to Mexico because I live only, you know, 45 minutes away from it and we got lost down there on purpose. I just got unplugged and took two weeks. Find a little place, stay put. Don't mingle with a lot of people. I just got to get unplugged. I'm not a guy that gets depressed. I'm not a guy that gets down much at all, man. I'm one of the most eternal optimistic guys I know. But about three weeks ago, I realized this season that we're in was getting to me. And you know why? Because I was focused on them, they, they, their, them, they, 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 their 17 times. 
How much are you getting caught up in your social media right now? How much are you focused on the Canadian politics right now? How much are you focused on the news right now and everyone's facts and everyone's truths? How much are you being consumed right now by the mist, by the vapor, by the temporary things? Now, don't get me wrong. Your politics, your health, the COVID, those are serious things, but they're temporary. And I found I was focusing so much on the world, especially the problems we have in the States right now. I'm trying to figure out how can I become a Canadian citizen? I want to work up there with you, Mark. I don't know. But the church I love, this is what I want to do. And this is where Asaph was. So what did he turn to? He goes, man, so that got me looking at myself. And this is where Psalm 73 goes. And so then he ends this. And he says, surely in vain, I have kept my heart pure. In vain, I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long, I have been plagued. I've been punished every morning. And if I had said, I will speak thus, or if I give in, I would have betrayed your children, O Lord. When I tried to understand this, it was oppressive to me. Until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Circle the pronouns. You want to just read the pronouns where he goes instead of 17 times looking at them and they and getting depressed. Now he looks at me, my, I, 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 me, I, I. You want to look at the world around you right now. It's a great way to get into some depression and bad headspace. You want to start focusing on yourself right now. It's a great way to leave us disappointed. Focusing on others is going to get us depressed. Focusing on self is going to get us disappointed. Why? Because it's not paying off. It doesn't look like I'm being blessed. Surely in vain, I'm doing all this stuff. I tried to handle the work situation the best I could. I tried to handle the divorce the best I could. I tried to handle the lawsuit the best I could. I tried to handle that you fill in the blank the best that I could. And where did it get me? It got you exactly where David was. I'm burning up at night. I feel like this stuff's pent up. I'm a volcano about to explode. It got you exactly where the chief worship leader of Israel was. I went from depression to incredible disappointment. So why am I doing this? Why does it even matter? These are amazing men of God in the Old Testament who have come to a place of great depression because of their perception. And they're showing us, here's how to get out of it. Until I entered the sanctuary of God and then it clicked. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as mere fantasies. Where did your worship leader need to go? Brevity of life. God, I was getting so caught up in temporary stupid stuff. These people I'm so angry with, I realize it's like a dream. They're here today and gone. They're mere fantasies. It's a breath of life. It's the exact same picture David gives us, the exact same picture James told us about being a mist and a vapor. It's not to diminish you. It's to give us perspective. So this is where the chief worship leader leaves us. When my heart was grieved, when my spirit was embittered, I was senseless. I was ignorant. I was like a brute beast before you. Oh, God, the, the patience you had to have with me. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will take me into glory. Whom do I have in heaven but you? And on this earth, there's nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. What am I fighting with them for? I need to be fighting for them. And you destroy all who are unfaithful to you. Homework. Circle the pronouns at the end of Psalm 73. You, 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 your, you, 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 your. When I focused on them and they, I was incredibly depressed. I started focusing on myself and my life and how come it's not paying off and when do I get mine? And I got incredibly disappointed in myself. But you know what? I got more disappointed with God because I'm trying to do what the page is saying. It's just not paying off. Congratulations, you make a great King David. Congratulations, you make a great chief worship leader. Congratulations, that's good Bible. You're almost there. That next step is... I forgot to focus on you, 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 O oh Lord, you, my God, you, 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 and yours. Man, I got caught up in this. 
I took two weeks and unplugged and I went back and I lived in Psalm 73. Can you guys see that? Can you see how much writing? This wasn't like the first time I discovered it. I have camped out in Psalm 73 and Psalms 39 for the last 20 years of my life. And even though I teach this, there are moments I still need to unplug and come back to it and go, man, I fell for it again. I fell for where we are as a culture. I fell for our national politics. I fell for this COVID season. It's taken away our fellowship, our church time. I'm focused on the negative. I'm focused on the negative people have to me. I'm focused on myself. I'm wallowing in it. And I forgot whose I am because I got so caught up in who I am. (laughs) Are you there? And he ends where we end. So as for me, it's good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge and I will tell of your deeds. There's three things, Village Church, that we need to major on today. Our proximity to God. So as for me, I'm going to be near God. Because the more I focus on them, they, or me, I find I'm further from God. It's not just that I accepted grace and mercy in my life. I need to continually walk in God's grace and mercy. How often do you practice the presence of God? Oh, I hope that's daily. For me, it's going to be near God. And secondly, you are going to be my hope and my strength. It's our proximity to God and it's our provisions from God. God, I'm expecting my nation to do something right. I'm expecting our our healthcare to do something right. I'm expecting the COVID season to have answers. I'm, I'm putting my faith and hope in a lot of other things but you. It's my closeness to you and you are my hope and strength. Nothing in heaven and earth I desire more than that. And then lastly, and then I'll tell of your deeds. And that reminds me I have a purpose here. And my purpose here isn't to make this life great. My purpose here is to bring others with me in the next life. Because everything else is temporary. Hey, I want to apologize to you guys. If you're sitting there and you're like, I'm the most encouraged I've ever been. This has been the best season of my life. I'm full of joy. I don't have a negative thing going on. Then this message was a bummer for you. I'm sorry. This message was for every Christian that felt like I'm doing the right thing. I'm trying to give it to God. And man, I'm getting so frustrated right now with the season that we're in and I'm getting so disappointed and depressed and with other people and myself. Congratulations, you're in the Bible amongst great leaders who just had the wrong perception. It's not them, it's not there, it's not me, it's not I, it's not us. Until I enter the sanctuary of God and look up, none of this is gonna make sense. And that is where I find my promises, my power, my provisions, my purpose, because that is my salvation. May you spend time today taking a walk, a, back, a bike ride, sitting in a chair, a drive, just keeping in mind you have a God who cannot, will not ever take his hands, his eyes off of you because he calls you son, daughter. Oh, he knows that you brought in. He knows the mess that you've made. And he doesn't ask you to get cleaned up first. He's the one that reached down and pursued you and picked you up and said, this one's mine. This one's mine. It's whose you are, not who you are. And if we're focused on this life and who we are, I promise as a Christian, you are allowed to be disappointed with yourself and God and depressed. Great leaders have shown us that example. But you want to change your perception today to whose you are and who you get to be a stranger in this land with Well, focusing on God will bring you delight, not depression or disappointment. Can I pray for you guys? Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this jacked up church that decides to meet in movie theaters and high school auditoriums and instead of building a giant building, having venues and campuses, a church that has an audacious, arrogant desire to go coast to coast and reach an entire nation because you have a desire that is audacious to reach an entire nation. God, to do that, you need people who are truly yours. May you take those today that are watching this and they've been depressed and they've been disappointed and they need to find the value of whose they are and their hope and purpose again. And in spite of what their truth tells them, what they deserve and have earned from you, that there is a higher truth that we get your love, your forgiveness, your justification, we are seen and made right in your eyes. May we be men and women that walk in that truth. And may that give us the grace and mercy that Village Church needs 
for a Canada around them that is in desperate need of grace, mercy, hope, and joy. May it change the lives of individuals to change the life of a church to continue to change lives of individuals. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I will never deserve it. I will never earn it. And I promise I will never live up to it. So thanks for being deeply, passionately, and intimately in love with me and for desiring me more than I desire you. May we practice your presence this week. And may that change who we are because of whose we are. In Jesus' name, amen.